Well, we're in 2 Chronicles, chapters 9 through 12. And this is just going to continue the Davidic dynasty. We'll have a chapter on Sol the final chapter on Solomon, and then we'll get into Rehoboam and all of that. Now, First and Second Chronicles take the form of a history. David and Judah are the focal points because the emphasis is on the priestly and Levitical orders. First, first and Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings are the historic, the, the, the political record. Chron first and Second Chronicles is the religious or, or priestly view of it all. Ezra and Nehemiah Chronicles probably were written by the same a collection of scholars or uh, scribes operating under Ezra probably. Um, and uh, because uh, Chronicles takes us up to the Babylonian captivity, Ezra and Nehemiah, what happened subsequently. So they're all together and they obviously had access to a very substantial library because there's all kinds of letters accessed between all the major political uh, leaders of that time. And uh, from the point of view of the timeline that we had in Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, uh, obviously, the monarchy starts with Saul and goes until the exiles of various kinds. And uh, 1 Samuel takes us up to uh, the beginning of David. 2 Samuel is really the story of David. It's parallel to 1 Chronicles, in effect. From Solomon on, we have 1 and 2 Kings. And in some renderings, obviously, 1 2 Samuel and 1 2 Kings are 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Kings in some Bibles, but it's the same, same material. And 1 uh, and 2 Kings split Elisha, Elijah and Elisha, actually. But anyway... Um, First Chronicles is really parallel to Second Samuel, and Second Chronicles will be essentially from Solomon on, right up to the Babylonian exile, and uh, where First and Kings dealt with both southern and northern kingdoms and how they were fought and all those details, and are really the political, you know, the historical record. Chronicles really just focuses it on uh, the the uh, southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, and so. Uh, we had in First Chronicles, obviously, nine chapters of genealogies and then the reign of David. In Second Chronicles, we had nine chapters that deal with Solomon. We're taking the ninth of those ninth chapters tonight. And then we're going to go right into the whole, con the rest of it is uh, the continuing Davidic dynasty. The, uh, okay, so we're in the reign of Solomon. Original name was Jedediah. Uh, Solomon was his royal name. And his pen name, uh, private name, uh, with Bathsheba was Lemuel, uh, many scholars believe. It seems to, and it's an inference, but it may be justified. And he also calls himself the Coalith, or the preacher for Ecclesiastes and so on. So he was, he was also a collector of dark sayings, as Proverbs 30 deals with. He was the second son, the surviving, first surviving son of Bathsheba, and uh, the first after their legal marriage in 2 Samuel 12, probably born about 1000, 1035 B.C., he succeeded his father on the throne, uh, probably as a late teenager, 16, 17 years old. And um, he was, his father, uh, uh, Nathan, and Bathsheba and Nathan recognized that Adonijah was getting ambitious and starting to declare himself as king. So uh, they, they encouraged David to cut that off by establishing Solomon as his successor before he dies, not wait for his death, which he did. Adonijah was the fourth son of David, and his elder brothers became, uh, you know, died, so he became the heir apparent, presumably. But um, Solomon, his younger brother, was preferred above him, as far as David's concerned. So Adonijah, while his father was dying, tried to uh, cause himself to be proclaimed king. But Nathan and Bathsheba headed that off by getting David to give orders that Solomon would be at once proclaimed and admitted to the throne. So that's why Solomon was a little young, but that's the way David wanted it, and so he headed off Adonijah. Ad Adonijah uh, fled, but when apprehended, he received a pardon for his conduct as long as he showed himself a worthy man, according to 1 Kings 1 5. Well, he, tried to, he didn't learn. He tried a second attempt to gain the throne and was seized and put to death. His uh, uh, accomplices were also, however, were, were forgiven. Solomon still might have spared Adonijah, but there's an intrigue going on with Abishag, uh, David's concubine, who probably was the person that's featured in the opera known as Song of Songs. But uh, anyway, Solomon was mer merciful to the rest of his brothers. And before his death, David gave him a whole list of things to do, and gave him his instructions. That's all listed in 1 Kings. And uh, then De Solomon arranges his affairs, marries the daughter of uh, Pharaoh of Egypt, and... Uh, the last half of his reign gets all messed up because he 
indulges in all these wives, 700 of them plus 300 concubines, um, 1,000 women. Whew. But the problem is that they all brought with them their pagan practices, and he tolerates that, and that eventually that toleration uh, brings his downfall. So it took seven years to build the temple, 13 years to build his royal palace, which was huge, and uh, in front of the house of the porch of pillars and so forth, and it was the house of the forest of Lebanon was, was a huge hallway for like an armory, if you will. And then in front of that was the hall of judgment and his throne room, and it was also a portion of it was set aside for the daughter of Pharaoh. So it was really an awesome, awesome. But Tom was quite a builder. Now, typologically, Solomon is often overlooked in typological. All through, everything in detail about him is littered in sixes. And uh, we want to be sensitive to that. We'll talk a little bit about that in this session. The Seal of Solomon is the ancient rendering of what is now known as the Magan David, the Shield of David. But that's a recent appellation uh, emerges from about the 14th century, that recently. Much earlier, it is known as the Seal of Solomon. And it was used by occultic practitioners. Who knows how we, we, it's very fragmentary. It's interesting how Solomon all through the New Testament is used in a diminutive sense. David is always extolled as great. Solomon always, was great, but not quite great enough. The lilies in the valley, you know, were, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He's always used as a standard that something else is exceeding. Anyway, let's move in. Uh, chapter 9, the visit of the Queen of Sheba. Now this gal is quite a gal. Once you understand, she lives 1,200 miles away. There's no railroads, no airplanes, airplanes. When the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem, with a very great company of, and the camels that bear spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. 1,200 miles. She really must have had a yearning to find out what was behind all this fame. Here's a secluded Arabian queen that would break through the immemorial customs of her land and put forth the energy to brave the perils of a 1,200-mile journey on, uh, on beasts of burden. Um, she carried it out safely. She must have wanted to come very badly. I hesitate to go 1,200 miles in an airplane. I have to want to very badly to do that. So anyway, she communed with him of all that was in her heart, and Solomon told her all her questions. And there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. These two were apparently, the term we might use is intimate. There is a legend we're going to talk about that they gave birth to, uh, she gave birth to a son for Solomon that has, uh, that is at least claimed to be the lineage all the way to Haile Selassie. We'll talk about that here in a minute. When the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel, his cupbearers also and their apparel, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. She was filled with amazement. Now, she was a queen from southern part of Arabia. She was no country hick. She, she knew the game. And she saw his wealth and the uh, opulence there. She was blown away. And, uh, and she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard mine own land of thine acts and of thy wisdom. How be it, I believed not their words until I came and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me. For thou exceedest the fame that I heard. That's probably where we get that expression. The half of it wasn't even told me. 
She was told so much she didn't believe it, and that wasn't the half of it. That's really what the, the net of it is. That's pretty straightforward communication here. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. His staff apparently communicated joy, not oppression, not slavery, happy. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on his throne to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore made he the king over them to do judgment and justice. She's saying God must really love your people to give them a king like you. That's the flavor of what I think she's saying there. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold. <whistles> talents, about 70, 80 pounds, maybe 90. Hoo-wee. She brought car fare. Hmm? And of spices, great abundance, and precious stones, neither was there any such spice as the queen of Sheba gave the king of Solomon. And the servants also of Hiram, and the servants of Solomon, which brought gold from Ophir, brought algum trees and precious stones. And the king made of algum trees terraces to the house of the Lord, and to the king's palace, and harps and psalteries for singers. And there were none such seen before in the land of Judah. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which she had brought unto the king. So she turned and went away to her own land, she and her servants. We have no idea how long she was there. It wasn't, just a, it wasn't a weekend visit. And yet we have no real idea. And that gives rise to, I'm call, to this Ethiopian legend we're going to talk about. This isn't just a casual legend. It is the official belief. It's in the constitution of Ethiopia. The Ethiopians claim to the Queen of Sheba as detailed in the famous epic, Kebra Nagas, the glory of kings. And it's based on a visit described in the Bible, but adds that the queen bore a son, Menelik, Menelik I, if you will, to King Solomon. That's what's added to this epic. And uh, this epic is a 13th century, they traced it that far back, A.D. we're talking. So uh, when Menelik was grown, presumably, he visited his father, Solomon, who anointed him to rule Africa and sent the sons of his own counselors to assist Menelik as king. That's the concept. That's the story. And the young men were reluctant to leave the famous temple in Jerusalem, especially as it contained the Ark of the Covenant. So the legend is, is that they secretly removed the Ark of the Covenant and left a replica. And they took it with them to Ethiopia. And uh, that's the legend, the Ethiopian legend. It is an official view inculcated in the history of Ethiopia. It is quickly disprovable from the Bible. So you have most people who have encountered this legend. Graham Hancock wrote a book, The Sign of the Seal, and Grant, Grant Jeffries has written some stuff about it. Uh, Bob Cornuk and I, uh, Bob has really gotten to this. Bob and I have visited Ethiopia on several occasions. And so we, when, when you do that, you encounter this view of the Ethiopians. For centuries, the Ethiopian tradition has maintained, and it is still preserved and guarded uh, in the compound, that, that the ark is in, guarded, still there, guarded in the compound. Now, the Ethiopian legend was compiled and recorded in writing during the 13th century, but its origin is difficult to determine. And uh, from the restoration of the Salmonic dynasty around, uh, 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 from the restoration to, to around 1270 until the death of the last emperor, Haile Selassie, the emperors of Ethiopia have claimed descent from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Now, on the one hand, that's what the Ethiopians cling to because those early kings promoted this tale because they, it benefited them to be able to claim direct descent from Solomon. You follow me? Haile Selassie did, at the, even as late as uh, 1975. Because biblical scholars can tell that that story can't be true, and I'll show you why, they dismiss the Ethiopian legend altogether. That's just their culture of tradition. What everyone, virtually everyone, has overlooked 
is just because the legend isn't true doesn't mean they don't have the ark. It may have gotten down there by a different path, and that different path is in Second Chronicles. It's in the text. It's tucked in there. It's subtle. You have, to do some inf- you have to do some inferential reasoning, but it's quite surprising. So this isn't strong enough to be a doctrinal point to try to teach from, but I will tell you as candidly, we suspect, we don't know, we suspect they may really have the ark. They're just victims of a tale that was promoted for political reasons in their early history for local advantages. And uh, that doesn't mean that the ark ain't there because there's, arche- there's archaeological proof that it is. And we'll get through that. Haile Selassie was born in 1892. He died in 1975. He was the grand nephew of Emperor Menelik II. He was the last emperor of Ethiopia. He, he, he uh, reigned from 1930 through about 1974 when he died. And the Solomonic claim was made part of the Constitution in 1955, obviously by Haile Selassie, who was writing things at the time. But recognize it was there an interest to promote this tale. It's widely regarded as non-biblical because the ark didn't disappear in Solomon's day or even after. A, we're going to go through a whole series of kings. You're going to get all the way down to Josiah. And when you get to Josiah, you're, about, uh, you're in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 35, the next to the last chapter in Chronicles. In the days of Josiah, he instructs the Levites to put the ark in the, in the Holy of Holies. Where is it? Why is it? That's the whole thing we'll get into. But the point is the ark is around there, you know, uh, a couple of centuries after the story about Menelik having taken it from, you follow me? So we'll deal with that. And uh, furthermore, there's another aspect of this we'll talk about when we get there. Jeremiah 3.16 predicts that the ark will no longer remember, be remembered or come to mind. The ark, according to Je- Je- uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 16, implies that the ark is a past, it, it, don't, don't look for it. It'll no longer be remembered or come to mind. And I'm among those teachers who used to use that verse again and again to dispel the whole Ethiopian myth. People get hear about it, get excited about it. We'd say, well, wait, look at Jeremiah 3.16. It says, don't, don't, don't bother with that. We didn't read the verses that followed it, which changed the subject a little bit, but give us some insight. So we'll deal with that when we get to it later. We're going we're gonna to talk about some very surprising conjectures about the Ark of the Covenant in a later session. In the meantime, let's keep moving here. Chapter 9, now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. That, incidentally, um, three score is 60, so you got 666 talents of gold. That's his annual salary. It's mentioned twice in the scripture. When you get 666, anybody, as a Jewish rabbi will point out to you, any time there's an unnecessary detail in a story, that's like a, it's called a remez, which is like saying, dig here. It's a hint of something deeper. And anybody that studied the Bible that, that knows nothing else about the Bible all heard about 666 is somehow, I mean, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But it's interesting that 666 from a biblical text point of view seems to be linked to Solomon himself somehow. That's often overlooked by some of these prophecy buffs. Beside that which Chapman and merchants bought, all the kings of Arabia and governors of the country bought, brought gold and silver to Solomon. In other words, he made a lot more than this. This was just his salary. That is just singled out for some uh, uh, spiritual purpose. The seal of Solomon has been found to be a very ancient symbol used by occultics. This thing here is a, is a set of signs that's supposed to help women from getting miscarriages. But the point is, it's in a context of Jewish mysticism, ancient, ancient Jewish mysticism. In those days, many, many, many centuries ago, it was known as the Seal of Solomon. It reemerges in history about the 14th century where it's called the Shield of David and is adopted as a symbol of Judaism. And of course, is widely recognized that way today, and that's why the Israeli flag has the Shield of David on it. That's not the official symbol of the state of Israel. You know what the state of Israel's official symbol is? The menorah. You see it on the official government documents. It's not the shield of David or whatever. So just be sensitive to that. Uh, 
It's in Revelation 13, speaks of the Antichrist, this, uh, uh, one of the two guys. There's, remember, the Antichrist is really a duet of two guys. As the second guy that exercises all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The deadly wound is apparently a, a somehow a, the first beast has a head wound. He's thought of as dead, but he apparently comes back to life. His deadly head wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, that is the second guy here, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's something just Elijah used to do, right? And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, meaning the first beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. In other words, it keeps, whenever he wants to emphasize the first beast, that's always the identity. He had this wound by a sword and yet he lived. An apparent resurrection from the dead it would seem. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. He had power to give life to the image of the beast. Most of us think of maybe some kind of elaborate puppet or something. But when you see a movie like King Kong and so forth, and you realize what the technology has done, made possible, I should say, to create lifelike creatures, images of them, uh, it really is breathtaking. And we have the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Strange place to receive an insignia of some kind. In their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Wow. The word there is, is for the, you know, the seal or the mark is a karagma, a seal. A mark in the Torah is prohibited. A tattoo is prohibited. Leviticus 19 and 21, Deuteronomy 14, Isaiah 49, Ezekiel 9 and uh, Exodus 13 are places where that is emphasized. And then the last verse of chapter 13 has spawned more books by more people. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. And this is the 666. People who know nothing else about the Bible all know about the 666 as being somehow related to the Antichrist. 666. The word in the Greek, Christos, take the first and last letter and put this funny little uh, um, Greek letter that looks like a snake in between, and you get the Antichristos, the Pseudochrist. And uh, the, the first letter is worth, on the Greek uh, geometric scale, is 600, the next one's 60, and the last one's 60. That's, that's the way the 666 shows up in the text by the spelling of the Antichrist, interestingly enough. So we have. Uh, those three numbers. Anyway, but whose number are we talking about? Not yours, his. It's amazing to me how many people look to insertable chips, you know, can, or whether it's a, or RFID, radio frequency identification chips, that's a whole new industry coming, or barcodes. They all sort of associate the 666. No, 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 that's backwards. You got it backwards. The bar, some barcode systems do use six as a separator, and so they see the six that both begin in the middle and both ends. Aha, see that's somehow the 666. Well, it may have some impact. It's clearly, electronic funds transfer is an enabling technology for the coming world leader. No question about that. But taking on a credit card number and so forth isn't his number. It's your number. That's not the problem here. It's his number and name that are the critical identity. It's you don't get your credit card unless you take on his insignia. Where do you take his insignia on? Well, apparently on right hand or forehead. There's only one physical description of the Antichrist in the Bible I know about, and that's Zechariah 11:17, Last verse of chapter 11 of Zechariah. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. That's all we know. The speculation, it's a conjecture on the part of uh, some scholars, that 
because he apparently has an impairment from this sort. He, wa he, he wasn't killed. He's alive. But he has apparently a bad eye and a bad arm. And that's why people taking an identity with him take his insignia on their eye or on their right hand. It's a way of, if you were going to identify with true, uh, John Wayne and True Grit, you'd get a patch, right? eye patch, right? And, uh, or whatever. Uh, you know, in other words, it's a way of identifying yourself with your hero. And that's apparently, that's what it's talking about. And you don't get a PIN number or whatever for your ATM machine unless you are in with the good guys and you're aligned, you've declared allegiance to this leader. Which if you do, you forfeit any chance of ever being saved. And that's why it's such a big deal in the book of Revelation. So how interesting it is that Solomon's salary is that same number. Is there some kind of mystical link between the Antichrist and the King, king Solomon, the king of Israel? All kinds of conjectures, but they're just conjectures. Let's move on to 2 Chronicles 9, verse 15. And King Solomon made 200 targets, or shields, if you will, of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went into one target. These are shields that weigh 70 pounds, 71 and a half pounds. Can you imagine carrying one of those? They're decorative. They were just, uh, you know, it's a brag wall kind of thing. And 300 shields were made of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went into one shield. So they're half the weight. A little more practical probably. And one king, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Now if I ask you, where's the house of the forest of Lebanon? It's not in Lebanon. Okay? That is the label for Solomon, a part of Solomon's palace. They called it the forest of Lebanon because it had all these 45 foot timbers holding up the Huge, it's a huge room. So it was known as the House of the Forest of Lebanon. That's a formal title of this particular segment, the front end segment in the sense of uh, the, the royal palace. And uh, it was built of uh, cedar pillars and it also, served, it also served as an armory, 1 Kings 10. 100 cubits long, so it's half the length of a football field. 50 broad, 30 high, and four rows of pillars and hewn cedar beams over the pillars. There were 45 side rooms forming three stories of 15 rooms each. The pillar hall, the porch lying between the house and the for and of the force of Lebanon, the throne room and the judgment hall, and then the king's dwelling house and also that of, the, of Pharaoh's daughter. So huge, huge palace. It took twice as, almost twice as long to build the palace as it did the temple. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory, overlaid it with pure gold. And there were how many steps to the throne? Six, how interesting. How many fingers did a Nephilim have? Six, six fingers, six toes, how interesting. There are six steps to the throne with a footstool of gold, and they were fastened to the throne and stays on each side of the sitting place, and two lions standing by the stays. And twelve lions stood there on one side and on the other, upon the six steps. In other words, you've got a lion on each side of the six steps, you've got twelve lions, but there's six here and six there. Six lions on the left, six lions on the right, six steps we got six, six, and six again. How interesting. There was not light, the like made in any kingdom. I can imagine. And all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was not anything accounted of in the days of Solomon. That's an interesting remark, because you, as I say, in the, early, in the days of the Egyptian empire, much, much earlier, there were times that silver was kind of very valuable because it was hard to find. That changed, obviously. For the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. And what is Tarshish? That comes up in the scripture every once in a while. Every three years once came the ships of Tarshish bringing gold and ivory, uh, gold and silver and ivory, apes and peacocks. If these ships come every three years, what do you think? The, so the round trip takes three years, right? So how far away is it? It's a year and a half away. There's a lot of evidence that it was the British Isles. See, interestingly enough, King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom that God had put in his heart. What do we know about Tarshish? Well, it was a distant port from which silver, iron, tin, lead, ivory, monkeys, and peacocks were brought to Israel. First Kings 10, and Jeremiah 10, and Ezekiel 27. It's translated from the Akkadian to be smelted. That's what the name means. 
We know from Herodotus, chapter 4 of his, he wrote in the 5th century B.C., that Tarshish was beyond the pillars of Hercules. That means it's beyond the pillars of Hercules. If you go, go from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, you, by Gibraltar there, you pass through what's called the pillars of Hercules. Anybody has been navigating that would be a familiar term. Anyway, Herodotus says Tarshish is outside the Mediterranean. Okay. We know that Tarshish had strong ships capable of long voyages from Isaiah 60 verses 9 plus what we just read in Chronicles. The three, you know, a year and a half voyage in a ship means it's no fly-by-night ship. It's a rugged thing. There's a term called Britannia metal. Tarshish was an island over once, you know, about a year and a half away, which was, among other things, a key source of tin. Britannia metal was an alloy of 93% tin, 5% antimony, and 2% copper. It was used for making utensils, teapots, jugs, drinking vessels, candlesticks, urns, and other official maces. It was similar in color to pewter, but it was easier to work with than other alloys. So it, was, it, it is a metal that's common in the ancient cultures. Global commerce from Britain was confirmed by archaeological discoveries at Stonehenge at 1500 B.C. That's what's sometimes called the Bronze Age. Tin was exported to Europe in large quantities from Cornwall, England during the Roman period. So, so this implies that Tarshish, there, it's not conclusively provable, but it is a, a reasonable inference that Tarshish is a reference to the British Isles. We know that Tarshish was as far away as they could think of from Israel. Because when Jonah was trying to flee, he took a ship to Tarshish. That's sort of like us taking a ship to China. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a figure of speech to get away as far as you can think of getting, to get to the other side of the world, so to speak. And that's the way Tarshish was viewed, at least. Okay, so... Anyway, they brought every man his present, vessels of silver, vessels of gold, and raiment, harness, spices, horses, mules a rate year by year. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the chariot cities with, and with the king at Jerusalem. And he reigned over all the kings from the river even unto the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. And the king made silver in Jerusalem as stones and cedars. Trees made he as sycamore trees that are in the hollow plains of abundance. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt and out of all lands. Wow. His rule, Solomon's rule, extended from the Euphrates River to Egypt's border. 1 Kings 4. He had incalculable wealth that was largely produced by his trading expertise. Yes, he had all these incredible gifts brought to him. But at the same time, his trade was very skillfully organized and produced wealth that is beyond imagining. Now his kingdom did not fulfill the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis, in chapter, Genesis 15, 18. Why? Because many countries in that territory only paid tribute to him and were not assimilated into the nation of Israel. There's a technicality. Some people say, well, it was, it was met, the, 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 the Abrahamic covenant it was met in Solomon's day. Not exactly. Close, but not quite. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, in the prophecy of Ahijah the uh, Shilonite, and in the ver uh, visions of Edo the seer against Jeroboam the son of Nebat? These are books obviously lost. There's a long list of about a dozen of these uh, sources that are referenced but have been long lost in, through history. And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. That's pretty cool. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Which brings us to chapter 10. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. It's interesting, though Solomon had many, many sons. He had a thousand. You know, he had 700 wives, and then 300 second-rate concubines were not prostitutes. They were just... Low, uh, second rate wives, so to speak. They had a status, but not that of a, a wife. And anyway, so he had a lot of sons. Can you imagine? None are mentioned, except Rehoboam. It turns out to be a mess, but okay. And uh, uh, he begot by Nehemiah the Ammonitus. And uh, he apparently began to realize there was alienation on part of the northern part of the kingdom. So he goes up to Shechem, which was a major stronghold in the northern part. 
Uh, that's where uh, he, he, Rehoboam goes to be formally crowned up in Shechem and because uh, it was important in Israel's life. It came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. Now get Jeroboam fled from Solomon the king. He was in exile in, in uh, Egypt. When he hears that, Solomon, you know, that, that Rehoboam's out, he comes out into the light of day here. So he, this is all going to take place at Shechem. And uh, Shechem is a very important uh, town in the whole history of Israel. That's where Joshua reaffirmed the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, it's been more or less, it was, a, it was one of the major cities, well, not a capital exactly, but close to that, uh, in, the, in the north part of the country. And they sent and called him, so Jeroboam, and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, this is an important meeting now. Thy father made our yoke grievous. In other words, they're saying taxes are oppressive. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. That's a cool deal. Solomon is excessively wealthy anyway. Taxes are way too high. Taxes themselves are relatively new because they didn't have taxes in the days of David. David funded most things out of his pocket because as the king he received the bounty of these wars and he would distribute it. That's not the same thing as taxes. But under Solomon there was taxation and it was very heavy. And if you, re if you, you, know, if you relieve this yoke you put on us, we will serve thee. That's the deal. And he said unto them, come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. So that's their proposition. If he had a brain in his head he would have taken it. See, Jeroboam was formerly the foreman of, of the foreman of the labor in Ephraim, where Shechem was located. Shechem is in the, Ephraim is the county, and Shechem would be the city. And when he heard Solomon died, he returned from Egypt because he had fled for some reason sometime previously. And uh, so he was by sort of by popular demand, Jeroboam headed the delegation that appealed to lighten the taxation, asking for three days to consider the matter. Jeroboam consulted the old advisors of his father, who counseled him to listen to the uh, 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 listen to the Israelites. King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, "What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people?" And they spake unto him, saying, "If thou be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever." Good advice, right? But Rehoboam, he forsook the counsel in which the old men gave him and took the counsel with the young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. And he said to them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. So he's surrounded by these young squirts that think they know everything. The young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. A scorpion is kind of whip with little metal pieces in it that catch the flesh, you know. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king bade, saying, Come again unto me on the third day. The king answered them roughly. And the king Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men. He answered them after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was of God, that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahijah, the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The, um, he, uh, he had already promised, God had promised Jeroboam that he would rule over the northern tribes. So this was the precipitating event, but there was a destiny here that, of the thing breaking up. And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? For we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse, Every man to your tents, O Israel, and now, David, see to thine own house. So all Israel went to their tents. In other words, they're basically, Israel is declaring their independence 
of Judah, is what they're doing. For as the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent to Hadaram, which that was over the tribute, and the children of Israel stoned him with stones that he died. His tax collector gets murdered, in other words. No surprise. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. I can imagine he wanted to get out of that town pretty quick. He's in hostile territory. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. So the kingdom divides because Rehoboam's ill-advised policies. When Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered the house of Judah and Benjamin and 104 score thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against Israel. From now, we've got to be careful now because in this context, Judah is used as a phrase regarding the southern kingdom, Rehoboam and his gang. It is not just the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Simeon has already been folded into it, and its tribe of Benjamin is also aligned with them. So when here, when they say Judah, they mean the southern group, which is Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon for sure. There's going to be more coming. And uh, when they say fight against Israel, when they use that term in this context, it's the northern group. There's a northern group of tribes. Okay? They're not ten, and that's going to lead to another thing I want to get into. To fight against Israel that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. So these men are going to try to fight Israel and try to bring, reunite the, na the nation. They're not going to make it, of course. But the word of the Lord came to Shemei, the man of God, this is a prophet, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Notice that. If you've got Judah, you've got an area called Judah and Benjamin, but God is saying to, to say to the son of, uh, uh, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah. In other words, there are members of all tribes down there. That's the point I'm going to get to. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. God speaking, in effect. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense of Ju in Judah. He built even Bethlehem and Etam and Tekoa and Bethzur and Shoko and Adullam and Gath and Marisha and Ziph and Adarim and Lachish, Lachish and Azekah and Zorah and Ajalon and Hebron. Ajalon is a valley there in Beth Horon. That's a, anyway, uh, which are in Judah and in Benjamin fenced cities. Jerusalem is technically in Benjamin, not Judah, but this right on the border. So Judah and Benjamin for this purpose are together, obviously. He fortified the strongholds, put captains in them in the store of victuals and of oil and wine. And in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. And the priests, now get this, verse 13 is an important verse I want you to be sensitive to. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. Now get the picture. If you're a Levite, you did not inherit land in the first place. You had 48 cities. And your inheritance was God. You were all involved in the administration of the temple and the Levitical practices. Now you're in a region now that's under leadership that's hostile to the leadership you're loyal to, which is the temple. So what do you guys do, Le Levites? You up and move, those that are faithful, move south to join Rehoboam. With all his faults, he still has the temple, the priests, and all of that. So the priests and the Levites. Priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. You know the difference. Okay. The priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him, to whom Rehoboam, out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And he ordained, that is Jeroboam ordained, him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which they had made. Jeroboam sets up golden calves in Dan and Bethel and sets up his own priesthood to worship calves. If you are a Levite, that's an anathema. That's what you're delivered from. So when you see all that going on, you get out of town. You go down where it's politically correct to worship properly, right? Are you with me? It's important to understand that. I'm going to suggest, it doesn't say this, but I'm going to suggest that if you're down south, 
and you're not faithful to the temple, you've had enough of all that stuff, you want to worship idols, where would you move? Up north, where it's politically correct. So there's a commingling of tribes. Don't confuse a label that's geographic with a label that's ethnic. You with me? Important to understand. Because there's more confusion about not making that discussion. So let's go on. And after them, now notice this, after them, that's the Levites, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. What it doesn't say, but I would assume that the, 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 the uh, malcontents, whoever they might be, would go up north and hang with the Jeroboam and his gang. You with me? Jeroboam, by the way, under Jeroboam I, they become incredibly prosperous up north. That's the whole mission of Hosea is to go up there and explain to them. They think, they think they've got it great, but not in God's eyes. That's later, but you get the picture. We have this myth that's all through English literature called the Ten Lost Tribes. And the idea is down south you have Benjamin and Judah. Up north you had all the rest of these guys. They affiliate themselves with the northern kingdom, the southern, Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom. By 722, God takes Assyria, he uses Assyria to wipe out the northern kingdom. In 722, the Assyrians conquer the northern and deport them. They become slaves. They never appear again in history. They not only deport them individually, they scatter them. They had a policy of mixing, commingling. Captives from elsewhere, they planted in their place. They, planted, they, 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 they deliberately broke down the national the identity of the northern kingdom. And the theory is that the, the tribes that were up there are lost because they then filter all through Europe and they become all kinds, there's all kinds of legends that derive from the so-called lost ten tribes. That's all, those, all, those are speculations that come out of a misreading of the scripture. Let's take a look at the tally here. The southern kingdom consists of Judah, Simeon, because it got assimilated into Judah earlier. So you've got Judah, Simeon, and Benjamin. That's the southern kingdom. No problem. What makes up the northern kingdom? Ephraim, that's the dominant one, and the word Ephraim often becomes uh, the, the synecdoche or the generic for the whole group. When they speak of Ephraim, they, often, they mean the whole bunch often. Manasseh, Asher, Naphtali, Zebulun, Gad, and Reuben, and Dan. Whoops, there's one more missing, the Levites. Except the Levites have joined the southern kingdom, right? We know that for sure. Well, if there are four tribes in the south, how many are there in the north? Eight. So there aren't ten lost tribes. There might be eight. Okay, so if somebody says, but ten lost tribes, ask them the name, what ten you're talking about. You'll discover right away it, dis it, it doesn't hold any substance to reality. If there are some lost for some reason, these, tr these labels are geographic, not tribal. Because by then there's commingling going on for all kinds of reasons. We were together so far. Okay, this is the basis, there's a concept of British Israelism you'll run into, and uh, all other kinds of legends that derive from this idea. It's amazing how militant some people are at clinging to these views. They're really quite incidental to our purposes, and at the same time, um, you'll find a, uh, this, this whole ten lost tribe idea is, from, is a misconception from a misreading of 2 Kings 17 and 2 Chronicles 6 and following. That's confusing the tribal terms rather than the geography. When the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom, which incidentally included remnants of all 12 tribes, they scattered their captives throughout the empire and repopulated the area, local area, with captives from elsewhere. They did, that was their policy. These descendants then in this area were known as Samaritans. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom, gets conquered by Assyria. The people that they actually leave there and don't transport are in effect considered half Jews because they're commingled with other captives of the Assyrians. They did that deliberately to break down the uh, ethnic barriers. That's why the Samaritans were viewed upon by Jews as half Jews because they had roots but they were, co they were contaminated in the Jewish mind. And you see that mentioned in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, speaks of the 12 tribes. The epistles of James and 1 Peter are addressed to the 12 tribes. There aren't 10 lost. 
See, the faithful voted with their faith before the Assyrian captivity, long before that. Substantial numbers of the northern tribes identified themselves with the house of David. They moved down south. When Jer Jeroboam uh, rebelled, uh, it caused many to repudiate the northern kingdom and unite with the southern kingdom in a common alliance. That's what we just read about with the Levites, but it goes all the way through. You can find it in uh, Second in, uh, Second Chronicles 19, 30, 20, uh, 34, and on and on and on. In 930 B.C., Jeroboam ruled the northern kingdom from his capital in Samaria. Jeroboam turned the northern kingdom to idolatry. The Levites obviously migrated south. Horrified that Jeroboam set up a rival religion, calf worship, both at Bethel and Dan, many more northern, northerners moved south knowing that the only place acceptable to God was the temple on Mount Moriah. That, that, that did it. It's my inference that those who favored idolatry would migrate north. It doesn't say so. But that's a natural inference. Later on, next, the next king we're going to see after Rehoboam is Asa in the south. When he reigned as king in the south, another great company also came from the north. Second Chronicles 15, we'll deal with that. And years after the deportation by Assyria, King Hezekiah of Judah issued a call to all Israel to come to worship at Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover. In other words, even uh, long after the, the deportation of the northern kingdom, Hezekiah could call all Israel, not just Judah, all Israel to come worship. In 2 Chronicles 30, we'll see that. Eighty years later, King Josiah of Judah will issue a call and offering the temple to come back from Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel. You see, you'll find, if you're watching, this whole ten lost thing is a fiction. It doesn't jibe with the text at all. See, eventually all twelve tribes are represented in the south and all twelve tribes are also in the north. And uh, in, first, in Second Chronicles 11, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin. We read that in chapter 11. And uh, so the main point I want to get you sensitized to is distinguish between the tribal designations and the territories allocated. They're, these are geographic terms, not ethnic terms. That's the point I'm trying to get across. And incidentally, Ephraim is sometimes used as a generic for the northern kingdom, the tribe of Judah is actually a phrase used generically for the whole southern kingdom. It doesn't mean just the tribe of Judah. It means the, the zone that, and, and his allies. So, so. so in 724, Shalmaneser V besieged uh, Samaria for three years. And uh, King Isaiah of Israel attempted to revolt against paying the Assyrians the tribute money. He, that was a big mistake. He had a treaty with the pharaoh of Egypt, but that didn't help any. He gets white. He, the Samaria, the, the capital of uh, uh, Jeroboam's uh, world, fell in 722 B.C. They pulled down towers, took captives, placed the Assyrian ruler over the city and looted it and so forth. And they impl implemented their policy of mixing conquered people to keep, from them, keep them from organizing a revolt. So the Israeli captives were mixed with Persians and others and strangers from far-off lands were settled in Samaria. And that led to the mixed populations. Interestingly enough, not all of the northern kingdom was deported. Archaeologists have uncovered annals of the Assyrian Sar uh, Sargon, which tells that he carried away only 27,290 people. That's a relatively small number, and about 50 chariots, according to biblical archaeologists in 1943. Estimates of the population were maybe up to half a million. So less than 120th were actually deported. Most of them were just commingled with other, commingled with other tribes. Later on, the Babylonians are going to conquer the northern uh, Assyria, and when they do, the Babylonian captives and the, the captives that they inherit with Syria will be commingled again. So again, we got all 12 tribes involved in both, both things here. And Isaiah takes advantage, in prophesying to Judah, refers to them as the house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel. He's using the term Israel then in, this, in its collective total sense. The word Israel then can refer in some context just to the northern kingdom, which is what they call themselves. It can also mean the whole nation in, as a unified nation. That's the idea. And uh, when the Babylonians later take the overseer, the descendants of the ten tribes, or so-called ten tribes, are probably again commingled with the other captives. The New Testament says the same thing. Jesus says, I've offered you, I come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's a collective term for the nation. Other tribes in Judah are mentioned specifically as being represented in the land, in all through the New Testament. Twelve tribes are talked about in Acts 26 and James 1.1 1, 1 and so forth. The reason, this, I'm reason hitting this so hard is this is also the root of anti-Semitism. People who tend to try to make, start, they make, start making, trying to make distinctions between the term, the term Jew and Israelite. Well, a Jew means Judah, and Israelite means, again, they're trying to build something on the separation. No, and that's not biblical. Ezra calls the returning remnant from captivity, he calls them Jews eight times, he calls them Israel 40 times. 
He calls them all Israel in another verse. Nehemiah calls them Jews 11 times, calls them Israel 22 times, all Israel being back in the land in Nehemiah 12, 47. In other words, these terms are not uh, uh, discriminatory the way some people try to make them. You want to be on your guard for that. That implies that when you hear someone start to do that, they have an agenda. Be careful. Malachi also indicates that the entire remnant was called the nation. Malachi 1, 1 and elsewhere. And remember Anna in Luke 2? She knew she was the identity of Asher. She knew what tribe she belonged from. Paul knew what tribe he was from. He was the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Jew and an Israelite. He's using those terms interchangeably. Paul was an Israelite and he was a Jew. But he was from Benjamin, not Judah. You see what I'm getting at? These people who try to make those distinctions are pursuing an agenda. The New Testament uses the term Israel 75 times in 73 verses. It, it, it uses the Jew 174 times. At the Feast of Pentecost, Peter cries, Ye men of Judea, Acts 2, verse 14. A couple of verses later, he says, Ye men of Israel. Same group, same audience. The Holy Spirit's underlining something here for us, I believe. And then a couple of verses later, he says, All the house of Israel, using it in a national sense. Right? So they're regathered as one. That's what the dry bones vision, Ezekiel 36 and 37, declares that Judah, Jews and Israel will be joined as one at the regathering. So there, are no ten, there aren't tribes that are lost. Okay? And this is true today. They're being regathered. And all this underscores is the total physical descendants were not the people to whom the promises were made. To get into that one, get into Romans 9, verses 4 through 7. It's speaking to the Israel of God, not just the fact that they have Jewish blood. It's a whole other issue. Not just the physical. The physical descendancy is not the issue. Anyway, moving on. And Rehoboam took him, Mahalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, to, be, to wife, and Abihail, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse, which bare him children, Jewish, Shemariah, and Jeham. And after her, he took Machah, the daughter of Absalom, which bare him Abijah, and Atai, and Aziza, and Shalemith. And Rehoboam loved Mecca, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines, for he took 18 wives and threescore concubines. <laughs> Guys must have been exhausted. <laughs> and begot twenty and eight sons and threescore daughters. And Rehoboam made Abijah, the son of Mecca, the chief, to be ruler among his brethren, for he thought to make him king. He dealt wisely and dispersed of all his children throughout the countries of Judah and Benjamin unto every fenced city, and he gave them victual in, uh, in abundance, and he desired many wives. So everything's going swell, it would seem, until we get to the end of Rehoboam. We have an attack by Egypt that God uses here. It came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself and forsook the law of lords. That's his mistake. He's doing pretty good. He made some mistakes about the taxation, but he made some other mistakes. He forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. It came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed the law against the Lord. Rehoboam had not been ruling long, obviously, and it became that his border fortifications were not adequate to guard Judah against the invasion of the Egyptian army under King Shishak. That's pretty obvious. Shishak was the founder of the 22nd dynasty. We're going to be particularly interested in the 25th dynasty, a few dynasties coming. But Shishak had earlier given asylum to Jeroboam. So Jeroboam was a buddy of the king. And so the king is attacking the enemy of his buddy, the southern kingdom. See how the, you, can, you can just imagine the politics here. In Rehoboam's fifth year, the Lord brought Shishak as a punishment for Rehoboam's sin of abandoning the law of the Lord. Continuing the text then with 1,200 chariots and three score thousand, 60,000, that's a formidable bunch in any man's army. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubims, the Sukims, and the Ethiopians. And by the way, something you may not realize, in, those, in that era, the Ethiopians were the successful warriors, very powerful group. That's not obvious, you know, unless you've done some study of African, ancient African history. And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Shimei the prophet said to Rehoboam and to the prince of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, said to them, Thus saith the Lord, ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Boy, can you imagine the king hearing that from the prophet of God? Ooh-wee. Thus saith the Lord. That's always a disturbing opening. 
Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the prince of Israel and king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. Boy, that's interesting. They acknowledge. They don't make excuses. They acknowledge it. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shimei, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance, and my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service, and the servants of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Where does it say anything about the Ark of the Covenant? If they mentioned the shields of gold, you'd think they would have mentioned the Ark if they had gotten it. See, there's a big argument among scholars. Some say they think the Ark of the Covenant disappeared in the attack of Shishak. And there's evidence to the contrary. But I just want you to be aware, that's one of six theories about the Ark of the Covenant, that Shishak took it. There's no evidence archaeologically uh, or textually to support that. But he did carry away treasures, obviously. Shields of gold which Solomon made. Instead of which, King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. They're probably more practical anyway. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him that he would not destroy him altogether, and also in Judah. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned, for Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord hath chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His, mother, his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonitess, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Wow, what a sentence. Think about that for ourselves. Do we do evil when we fail to prepare our heart to seek the Lord? You know, we read these quaint expressions in the Old Testament. They may not come home to roost, but we're probably in his shoes. When we fail to prepare our heart to seek the Lord, we're sinning. We're not only, dis not only dis disenfranchising ourselves from a benefit, we're actually indulged in sin. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemiah the prophet and of Edo the seer concerning genealogies? And there, were, and there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And Abijah, his son, reigned in his stead. So there we are. Abijah and Asa are the two kings we're going to see in the next session. I want you to read for next session, 2 Chronicles 13 through 16. We're going to, as we continue the rest of the book of Second Chronicles, there's going to be a number of kings show up, but the key ones you're going to keep an eye out for is Asa, next time, then Jehoshaphat, very colorful issue there, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Those are names I want you to be tuned into. Between Hezekiah and Josiah, there's a bad apple by the name of Manasseh. And you want to understand how bad that was in order to understand the peculiar things that occur in the days of Josiah. And you really want to understand, you really, this is all in preparation to get to chapter 35 of Second Chronicles, which is alone the, worth, the price of the course, so to speak. Because uh, there's, some really, there's some surprises there in the text that have been overlooked by, I would say, more than 9 out of 10 students that go through it. So we'll have some fun. But 2 Chronicles 13 through 16, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.